Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Before I introduce the guest for today, I'd just like to take a moment to encourage you to leave a rating or review for the show. If you enjoy listening or have found the show beneficial, you can really help others find us by leaving a positive rating or review if that's how you feel about the show. This helps boost the podcast visibility on podcasting platforms and is a free and easy way to help support our mission of protecting people from systems of control. Additionally, as some of you may have had the misfortune of experiencing personally, when you speak out against high control groups of any variety, there's often a backlash of criticism that comes from the group's followers. For us, that backlash occasionally takes shape in the form of a bad review, having nothing to do with the quality of the show, but having to do with the fact that someone is upset that I said something or one of my guests said something about a particular person or a particular group. These attempts to discredit the stories of survivors aims to discourage people from speaking up. But we continue undaunted. And if you have a positive view of our work, please let us hear your thoughts in an iTunes review or rate us favorably on Spotify. This will help balance out reviews that attack a specific survivor or the ones that begin with things like, I'm not just a disgruntled Scientologist, but (laughs) blah, blah, blah. It's a little frustrating, I must say. And there are also people who will say things like, I actually had a great experience with multi-level marketing. And so because of that, I'm going to give you a bad review for your show and on and on. Oh, it's been fun. So we appreciate the effort and thank you to the many, many people who have already expressed their gratitude for our work. It means so much. It means everything and really goes a long way. So, thanks to you. And for today, we have Kate Amber. She is the founder of End Coercive Control USA, an organization that helps survivors, leaders, advocates, attorneys, therapists, and other professionals in domestic abuse, extremist groups, human trafficking, cults, and organizations to detect and prevent coercive control. So important. She is a domestic violence, domestic abuse, and coercive control expert certified in the psychology of coercive control by the University of Salford. In addition, she is certified in executive leadership in violence and abuse prevention by the University of Pennsylvania at the Ortner Center. Kate consults, trains, and offers expert witness testimony in cases that involve domestic violence, domestic abuse, coercive control, and child abuse. Kate is also the creator of the psychosocial quicksand model of coercive control, which she continues to develop using evidence-based research, simplifying the complex and nuanced nature of the malevolent strategy of coercive control, allowing organizations and communities to detect, intervene in, and prevent coercive control wherever it may arise. Love all of that. And it was really wonderful to talk to her. And I'm so happy for you that you get to hear her now. Here is Kate. It is so nice to have Kate Amber with me today. There's so much for us to talk about and so much that you do and that you care about that I care about and I do. And I love that you started this organization. You have you run this place that really is a great resource. So tell us a little bit about you and what brought you into your interest in starting this organization. Let's start there. I had been in abusive relationship that I knew was domestic violence, but it wasn't quite what I was reading domestic violence was. And I was searching for the pieces that were missing from the definitions I was getting and from the books I was reading on domestic violence and domestic abuse. And I came across Evan Stark's book on coercive control, and it didn't take two pages (laughs) before I knew this 
this right here is what I'm dealing with. And so I sort of went on a journey to get more information about coercive control. I was looking everywhere I could get information on it and making connections in my mind. I decided I was going to go to the University of Pennsylvania. They have a violence and abuse prevention executive leadership program. And so I went there first to the University of Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I sort of created my organization in Coercive Control USA, or ACUSA for short, and did all the businessy things you do <laughs> to design a company. And then while I was finishing up at the Ortner School at the University of Pennsylvania, I ran across a university in England that had a master's degree program in coercive control. And so I jumped on that. <laughs> and I was thrilled to find out that because it was the one advantage that I could see from COVID was that because of the pandemic, they began the virtual learning program for their master's degree early. And I was able to participate in it with the North American cohort. So that was very exciting. Very exciting. Oh my goodness. Okay. So some of the things that we're going to cover today, and this is why I'm really glad I'm speaking with you among other reasons, is when you talked about abusive relationships, it was plural, right? And that's interesting because I do a support group for former cult members and people who've been in relationships with abusers and narcissists and others controlling them. And a lot of times they'll say, I was in this relationship, then I got in another relationship kind of just like it. I thought the person was different, turned out not to be. Then I got involved in a group where the leader was like that. And there's this repetition often that takes place. And to understand that without judgment, that there's a reason we gravitate towards what we gravitate towards, that is very subconscious and is also about the role we think we're supposed to play and what we think we're supposed to tolerate and what's okay. Like what doesn't register when it should, or maybe we think we don't have the right to say something or we don't have the bravery. There is something about people's wiring, their upbringing at times. And again, what they think they're supposed to be and do in a relationship and what a relationship means. And there's so much to sort of pick apart, but it happens often more than once in someone's life. So I wasn't surprised to hear that at all. And so I'm sure that's something that people address. Like, why did I find myself in something else? There's lots of reasons for that. And I think there's reasons on both sides. So first of all, I'd like to say that in my opinion, the biggest reason that a person gets into a controlling group or a controlling relationship is because they are actually targeted for it. Now, they may have been targeted because they had previous trauma. They may have been targeted because the person realizes that they're just coming out of an abusive relationship. And this is an easy time to go after this person and pretend that they're the hero and rescue you from that relationship. And of course, you're in a very vulnerable spot if you're leaving an abusive relationship. And the same thing goes for controlling groups. So if you've been raised in an environment where your boundaries are, let's say, not honored 100% of the time. When you're raised in that environment, it becomes difficult to know when you're allowed to say no. Like the way I even just said it just now, when. No, you are allowed to say no, right? But even my background, my upbringing was such that you were not always allowed to say no. And a lot, it was actually a lot of the time you weren't allowed to say no. So I was raised in a very fundamentalist Christian background. We uh, used to refer to it as the holy rollers, I think. <laughs> and in that environment, um, it's a very patriarchal environment and women are supposed to submit to the males. And so being raised in an environment where you're taught that as a woman, you're supposed to submit to your husband and then you get married and your husband is demanding something from you and using the Bible <laughs> as their justification for why they have the right to demand that from you. It's very hard to distinguish reality. It's very hard to hold your boundaries. For me, you, you said that people were, they had relationships that like they got into the same kind of relationship. Well, for me, it wasn't, they were abusive, 
but each was abusive in its own way. And like each one got progressively worse and progressively more covert and psychological. And I believe part of that is because I had more trauma by the time I got to the last one, right? So he had more things he could exploit. And so I've had relationships with very outgoing, friendly, lovable, sort of your narcissist who looks good in public. And then I had a very covert victim narcissist who's incredibly sadistic and cruel and doesn't look at all like somebody who could wield power over another person. So that's one reason I believe that it's difficult and why people can end up going into another group or another relationship is that they go, oh, well, this doesn't look like that. And it takes a while before they start to see, oh, yeah, it really it really does look like that. Right. It's interesting. I don't often talk about my own relationships. I mean, I'm in a very happy relationship now. In my past, though, because of my role in my family, et cetera, I grew up learning to be very kind of accommodating, going along with things. And Rachel won't mind. And that's fine. And I was the baby with siblings who were much more uh, opinionated or would cause more issue if things didn't happen the way I think that they wanted. But I would hear a lot. Oh, it's fine. Someone would ask, well, what does Rachel want to do? Well, it doesn't matter. She'll be fine with, with anything. And I learned to be fine with anything. And when I, I remember after two relationships where, uh, that were not at all healthy, someone I was dating after that said, what do you want to drink? And I said, it doesn't matter. And he said, how could it not matter? What does that mean? It doesn't, doesn't matter. And I said, I don't know. I don't know what that. I'm so, it was so reflexive, just, you know, I don't. And then I remember he went beyond and he said, it was a hot day. And he said, how many ice cubes do you want in that? I go, that's an option. Like, so, <laughs> ask you, and you can decide stuff and it doesn't piss people off and it's not a test. And, you know, it's not going to come back and bite you that you were being demanding. Like I froze, I froze, you know, and uh, he goes, why does, he, he just didn't understand. He said, why does this question scare you? I said, I have going to have to think about that. Because I thought this doesn't feel safe. First of all, it feels so foreign. But then I thought, oh no, it's a trap. Because my first one, it wasn't wouldn't have been safe because I was supposed to just go along with things and I wasn't supposed to be difficult. And the second one, it would come back to bite me. Uh, but he, he would seem fine, but then it wasn't fine. And I'd only find out later. And yes. So there are these different ways of operating where you go, oh, okay, I don't know. I don't know how to say water and two ice cubes without breaking out into a sweat, right? And ducking for cover, thinking what's going to happen because of that. But yeah, there were very different people on the outs on the outset, but ultimately, no. Right. And I read, um, after I read, maybe it was before I read Stark's book, um, I read uh, Women Who Love Psychopaths by Dr. Sandra Brown. And that book was eye-opening, incredibly eye-opening. In Dr. Brown's book, what she discovered was that there were certain personality traits that the survivors of psychopaths rated really high on. And this wasn't from the perspective of victim blaming that you often hear where, oh, well, you know, she just doesn't know how to pick them <laughs> or she does, right? She, she sure knows how to pick them. It wasn't from that perspective. It was just from a perspective, of, okay, well, are there things, and this is where I got the sort of the concept that these victims were being targeted. They were actually being targeted because of their personality traits. Two of the traits that she found that victims were very high in if they were involved with a psychopath, not necessarily your garden variety domestic violence perpetrator, but your high level sociopath, psychopath, malignant narcissist kind of person is that the victims of those folks tended to be incredibly high on conscientiousness and agreeableness. I don't know if you knew this about me, but I was involved with uh, Landmark Education Corporation about 20 years ago and was unaware of what kind of group I was involved in <laughs> for quite some time after when I was at the University of Salford studying coercive control. I was mainly there for intimate partner violence study. And that's when I discovered, oh, 
wow, these things were all happening in Landmark. (laughs) Oh my goodness, I was in a high control group or a cult or whatever you want to call that kind of environment. It was very eye-opening to discover that there were things that looked different from the outside that turned out that once you got inside there, they all turned out to be the same. So these conscientiousness and agreeableness are the same kind of things that people in a cult would target because they want really high functioning people who, like for me, I, I was overly responsible. You know, I would take on the responsibility in any conflict. The first thing I would think is, oh, this person's upset with me. What might I have done? How could I have said that differently? What could I do differently? What can I change? And cults love that. (laughs) They want people that are going to question their own self before they question the group or question the intimate partner that's causing the damage. Right. And in in so doing, and it happens uh, almost all the time, that people within cultic systems are more than happy to kind of look inward because they're already doing that. And then you're doing so much work for the cult leader. They don't even have to work hard to get it to be redirected onto you and away from them as having been the culprit. And so many times good people are reinforcing the coercion, they're reinforcing the manipulation, they're reinforcing the projection outward of the person in charge so that they can have this sort of Teflon coating and we absorb. And like, great, I get to just go on and and then I can also treat them the same way again or even worse because it will never be my fault. And, you know, when you're with someone who's healthy, they will notice that you're doing that and they'll say, well, no, I mean, maybe it's not all you. It could have been me too. And who knows? And, you know, that's like a breath of fresh air when you hear that because you're used to being around. I'm glad you saw the error of your ways about the thing that I did to you. <laughs> exactly. That right there is something called DARVO, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but just in case any audience members aren't, DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, and reverse victim and offender. And inside of a cultic environment or inside of a intimate partner violence relationship, there's already this sort of ongoing DARVO (laughs) where the person who's in charge is going to deny that they did anything wrong. And then they're going to turn it around on you with some sort of attack, whether that be a, a direct attack where they're directly cruel to you calling you names or screaming at you, or maybe they even become physically violent, or they could do it in a very covert and incredibly subtle way. Keith Raniere did in Nixium, the way that he set this whole thing up in a way where, oh, let's make sure that they ask to be branded (laughs) so that we can get past the coercion thing. So we've got to get it set up ahead of time so that we're prepared in case any of these people turn on us, that we've already overcome that. Yes. And right. So they can ask for it and people will often be put in that situation. Well, we asked you if this is what you wanted. And then you feel like you had to say yes, because that was the only way, well, for many, many reasons that felt very valid at the time. Something that I talked about previously on on the podcast was having been with someone for many years where if I got yelled at, which was actually quite often, I'd walk in not knowing what I was going to get busted for, like whatever it was, but that if this person I was with was upset, I needed to apologize even if, even if I got yelled at because it must be because I had done something previously to make them upset. There was the sense, and I f- found myself doing that and thinking, I was searching my brain thinking, what did I do? But somehow I'm apologizing for it. I don't know what it is, but it's the only way for me to get past this moment and move on with my day and be let off the witness stand. And so you can find yourself saying a lot of things and searching your brain the whole time thinking, I don't know what it is. I can't pinpoint the thing I did wrong, but I seem to need to acknowledge it and apologize. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I'm curious about Landmark too. And if you can talk more about that, because I've worked with a lot of people in Landmark and some who say it was really helpful to them and others who say, oh man, mm, I, I had to I had to extricate myself from it. So go ahead. Oh, well, so for me, I would fall into both of those categories. 
<laughs> so I got a lot of benefit from Landmark for a long time. And I was really happy with some of the things I got. For instance, I created my photography business in one of the seminars in Landmark. And I ran that photography business for 22 years. I had a very successful business. It wasn't one of the weekend things called like the there's the forum and the advanced course. Those are like weekend things. It was one of those 10 week things where you go every Tuesday night or something for 10 weeks. And I created my business there and I was thrilled to have been able to do that. I probably credited too much of that to them. If I look back now, I can see that really most of what happened with my business was because of what I had done and who I am with my persistence and my hard work. But at the time, it felt like a lot of that was coming from them. And it was in the advanced course when I first saw the cracks in the system, I saw a double standard. And double standards are one of my, my the psychosocial quicksand model that I developed for coercive control. It has uh, five Ds, double speak, double standards, double binds, double vision, and DARVO. So those are the five Ds of my model. Well, I saw this double standard in the advanced course on the final evening when they asked us if we were willing to play like our life depends on it. And I did not intentionally stand up. <laughs> they had the whole room stand up. And then they said, if you're willing to play like your life depends on it and bring 10 guests to the Tuesday evening course, you can sit down. You can sit down. Oh, my. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now, now any other time in Landmark, as a matter of fact, I can't think of any other time that they did that where they had us all stand up and then like where you got volunteered <laughs> accidentally, but I was accidentally volunteered and about half the room sat down. The leader talked for a while. Some more people sat down. Eventually after about 40 minutes or so, me and one other person were the only two people standing. And it turned into a one-on-one -on -one conversation between me and the group leader. And what I had to say to this person was, I think because one of the biggest things that Landmark teaches is being in integrity. And I said, I think Landmark is out of integrity with this conversation of recruitment. And to expect us to play like our life depends on it, to bring guests so that you can sign them up and make money from them. And so I saw this double standard where I was supposed to be in integrity, but they didn't have to be in integrity. So that's one of the things in my model that is a sign of coercive control. If you see a double standard, start looking around. If you can find any of the other Ds, then you're likely looking at red flags for coercive control. And But it's great because that's something relatable. A lot of people will feel there's, there's a double standard. A lot of people grow up in families where they felt that with their siblings, that one gets a pass and the other one doesn't. I mean, it's all around us. There are some students in a classroom who they'll just be overlooked when they're talking and another one gets to the principal's office. I mean, we were raised with double standards. And But I think in adulthood, you have the right to say something. And I guess, depending on how it's received, you find out a lot about the health of an organization, if they can notice and be willing to notice what they're doing. And so what was the reaction when you were pointing that out to them? We went round and round for quite some time. Essentially, the leader decided that I wasn't going to budge and decided to move on. And so she had me sit down and then she turned to the other person who had been standing with me, but after this incredibly long conversation, had herself also sat down. So she turned and looked at the woman and the woman popped right back up to her feet. Uh, uh -huh. And the whole room burst into laughter and the leader looked at her and she sat right back down. So what was really interesting is that after that evening, at the end of the night, when we, when we were all done and, and people were left their seats and were going home, I had person after person after person come up to me and tell me how they had got the advanced course in that conversation. And I'm like, that's really interesting. <laughs> like at the time, 
because I was still pretty much engrossed in Landmark. I still I had this thing with the integrity, but I still was pretty committed to Landmark education. And so I was taking this in as, you know, this was great praise and compliments and all this. And it was hard not to take all that in. But what I see now looking back is, isn't it interesting how, and I think I heard this on your podcast with another one of your guests where they said, you know, isn't it interesting how the day after the uh, spaceship was supposed to come get you and you're still standing there on the ground, all of a sudden they have a new uh, commitment. Like they they almost use the quote unquote rapture that didn't happen as a way to further believe that they're in the right place. Oh, that was that was a test. And look how we all passed the test. And we are being such perfect uh, followers of the guru. And, you know, they and that's how that felt was I saw a crack and that's not what they saw at all. Like they used it as further evidence of how amazing Landmark was. Right. So. That says so much about the lens through which you want to see something. And, oh, God, it's reminding me of the time that I read an article in the New York Times when I was living in New York that I heard about kids coming from a, I think it was a Christian fundamentalist school and being brought to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And when they left, they interviewed some of the teachers and some of the students. And the message was, this is what happens to people who are not saved and who don't believe as they should. It just validated their whole belief system and they could ignore all of the injustice and the suffering and political things and social, all of it. But just, yeah, now we have even stronger faith that we'll be protected from this. And they should have, I heard this, they should have been open to being believers and this wouldn't have happened to them. And I thought, wow. You can have a museum that, whatever, costs however much and has actual artifacts. And I mean, pain, there's just like a pain. It's a painful place to go. Very powerful. And I suggest everyone go. But still, how interesting that you can see what you want to see. But I'm glad that you stuck with it. And I also don't doubt that there were other people there who probably couldn't admit it, but didn't see it that way and were wondering about this group and were learning from you. But it probably wasn't safe. Because they watched how you were treated. It wasn't safe to say that then, but they may have been feeling it inside. Just from talking to so many people over the years, thousands of people, many of whom said, I wanted to agree and I wanted to come to someone's defense or that's the thing that helped me leave. But I couldn't say it at the time because I knew what would happen to me if I did. So it's always worth, I think, taking a stand because for yourself to see that you can. And also because I think there's an exponential impact that you just might not know about at the time. Well, and I was fully committed to Landmark, but I was not going to put my life on the line if I couldn't bring 10 people to the Tuesday night thing. I was not about to make that commitment because I know myself and I know when I make a commitment, I follow through and my life was not going to be on the line for Landmark. I'm sorry. (laughs) Right. No. And the lesson there isn't, wasn't even, you need to leave Landmark. It was, you need to be a part of something in a way that is in line with your conscience. Because if you're not, then after all, what happens to you, really? Who are you? And that you can find it some gray area. You should always be allowed. Like when, if I have a suggestion for a client, I'll, someone who's been involved in a cultic system or a controlling relationship, I'll often give them permission to not listen to it. <laughs> It was just my thought. I thought it might be helpful, but it's okay if you don't agree. You know, like it's okay. Let's work in the gray. That's where most of life is. And that's where you get to still be you, you know? So I'm curious about just how you would define coercive control. It's one of these words that is so important legally because it gives people a chance, really, legally, that people are going to understand something that might seem invisible. But I'm wondering for our audience how you would define it. What is coercion and what's coercive control? And how is it different from other kinds of control? There's lots of definitions for coercive control. Um, There's legal definitions. There are definitions from when Evan Stark wrote his book. And then years later, when he's writing papers, he's defining it a little differently. One of my favorite definitions is from 
I guess it's the Oxford Dictionary that says that it's when one person dominates or controls another person through the use of force, threats, or by instilling fear. And then I heard your interview of the folks from the Consent Awareness Network, and they were talking about consent. And I heard their definition of consent was the opposite, I guess, of anything that included force, fear, or fraud. And so I loved that other F. (laughs) And so now I'm kind of playing around with my favorite definition, of course, of control and thinking about whether I want to use the force, fear, or fraud, because one of the things that other definition didn't have was the fraud. And fraud is a huge component, especially with the more covert abusers, because there's not only manipulation, but there's a great deal of deception involved. And if you are brought into something like a group or a relationship with the understanding that it's one thing and it turns out to be something completely different, then that's fraud. And so coercive control is sort of an ongoing pattern of force, fear, or fraud. Interesting. Okay. I'm seeing, it's interesting too, because there's, there's had to be a very clear definition for something that's not clear. Like if somebody, if they can show that the door is locked and there is the lock or that they have a chain where they really can't move or they have bruises, something tangible, visible, it makes it a lot easier. And so much of what people deal with is the invisible piece And also the judgment placed on the other person. Well, why didn't you just leave? And, you know, you didn't have to stay and there was no lock on the door and all of that. So how do you respond to those comments that are unfortunately inevitable in response to a lot of these situations? Yeah. So that's why I called my model psychosocial quicksand, because they use these tactics and strategies that psychologically overpower us. They overpower our human psychology and they use social influence in a way that we are entrapped. And so just like quicksand is invisible on the surface, you can walk right into it and not even know that you're about to be trapped by it. And so the invisibility is one of the main problems that we're having with, I would say, one of the main problems that we're having worldwide with getting laws passed, because everyone's very concerned that if we pass coercive control laws, if we don't have these clear boundaries, like what you're saying, we don't have clear definitions and clear ways to determine who the perpetrator actually is. Because of this Darvo thing, how are you supposed to know who the perpetrator is? He's saying one thing, she's saying the exact opposite about, but the same thing about the other person. Like they're accusing accusing each other of the same behaviors. And how are you going to straighten that out? And so we have to find a way to make the invisible visible. And that's my hope with my training model is to help quickly and easily train people in how to detect coercive control. And that's why I've got the four doubles and a Darvo. The five Ds help you to see it easily. It kind of reminds me, one of the models that I synthesized into my model was uh, Steve Hassan's bite model. Because I loved the simplicity of it, the straightforwardness of it, right? He's got behavior, information, thought, and emotional control, right? So that's a great uh, way to think about coercive control, and it gives you an easy reference point. So that was what I was trying to do with my model, was to bring it down and simplify it, make the coercive control visible. With double speak, for instance, if you know what double speak is, which is basically the contradictory nature of the communication that comes from a coercive controller. They are so certain that they are right in every moment. And yet 10 minutes later, they might absolutely give you the exact opposite contradictory phrase. And they will say the exact opposite of what they had just said with just as much certainty (laughs) as they said it the first time when they said the opposite, right? So, or they lie, they're duplicitous and manipulative or their actions and their words don't match each other. Those are what I call double speak. And if you're a victim or 
a target or a survivor of coercive control, doublespeak is seen and found once you realize that you're feeling confused. So if you are with somebody and you're ta- you're in a communication with somebody and the conversation is going in circles and you're like, where is this going? You keep trying to resolve something. The person just keeps not trying to resolve it. Then, and you're feeling confused. Well, that's a clue that you're experiencing doublespeak. If you find yourself in a relationship or in a group or a situation where you are repeatedly becoming angry and you don't know what's going on, and maybe you can't, you can't really put your finger on it, you're probably seeing a double standard of some sort. You're angry because they get something that you're not allowed to have, or you're being punished for something that they did. That's a double standard, and that will make a person angry. If you're in a double bind, a double bind will make you feel trapped. It'll make you feel afraid, even terrified, and it'll make you feel like any decision you make is going to be wrong. And that's how you know you're in a double bind. So the Things inside the model that help you look for the the emotions to check for are the same things that will then point you to the signs of the double speak, double standards, double binds, and DARVO that a coercive controller may be using against you. And then the last one is the double vision, which is essentially cognitive dissonance. You might call it a trauma bond or Stockholm syndrome. At Salford, we called it trauma coerced attachment which I prefer because it places the blame on the perpetrator because the trauma was actually coerced. The bond was coerced by that perpetrator. So that's what double vision is. So if you, that's another thing where you'll be, feel really confused. You won't understand what's happening. And that points again to the fact that there's probably, you're probably in a situation where someone is using coercive control. It's so interesting to hear these things really honed in on and with definitions. One of the things that I talk to people about is that when they want to find out if something is a healthy organization or a healthy partner is to listen to what they say and also what they don't say. So if you're asking them a very particular question and it never gets answered, no matter how many words come out of their face in response. It actually helps because there can be the sincerity in their voice. There can be this turning back around. Well, I'm curious why you want to know that. Then you end up talking about yourself, having to explain yourself and uh, why that's important to you. And other people haven't asked that question. I'm sure people have, but then you suddenly feel like there's something different about you and you're kind of shamed like, oh, what's wrong with me that I needed to know that? Or you just have this wall of words hitting you. And by the end, you're thinking, wait, what was my question? So I will... (laughs) I'll often tell people if they get into that to write down the question so that after the person finishes talking or asking you questions about yourself and your relationship with your mother for some reason, all of a sudden, that you can actually say before you're done, hold hold a second and you read the question again and think what the answer. And it could have been, how much does this cost, you know, to sign up for this? And you really want to know, well, you know, let's talk about money. That's all relative. How important is money to you? What do you spend your money on? And is this important to you? And is your, is your joy or your getting over your victimhood important to you? And how do you put a value on things that are important to you? Blah, 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 blah. And you're just looking for a number and you still haven't gotten it. And even if you get a number, it's not total. It's that's just the beginning. Then we're going to pressure you to take more and spend more. That's really not what you're going to be spending. It's just the beginning. So did they answer my question? And then to think, why didn't they answer my question? Why do they not want to have that answer? But yeah, people will very often read, let's say a website for someone who's a healer or uh, something or for a weekend. And there's a lot of words that are non-definable, in not quantifiable that you're going to reach things. You're going to reach enlightenment. You're and what is that? Like, is that the eighth floor of a building? Like, is there something tangible? <laughs> well, no, I have reached that. <laughs> or do I have to wait until you decide I've reached it after I've spent as much money as I have been can, or have you you've been able to use me for free labor so I can reach this enlightenment when you decide? 
<laughs> or are we never going to get there? Because this is a lifelong thing. And it's rude of me to be asking. So the words that are used that I come across all the time with people who are kind of in that way of speaking, where people think it's very high level because it's not really understandable, which is also a fallacy, that if someone's not quite making sense, it could be that they're just not making sense. Right. <laughs> if your go-to is, oh, I wonder why I'm not understanding, as opposed to, why isn't this person making any sense? <laughs> right? Right. Right. Yeah. And then there's the social contagion where you have people nodding their heads because they see the other people nodding their heads. And you're like, I don't want to be the only one not nodding my head because then that means I'm the only one that doesn't understand it. You are never the only one that doesn't understand that if it's not understandable. That's right. You are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. You just might not be faking it or is nervous about not faking it as quickly. Or, But a lot of people think if I can just suspend my disbelief, then I'll receive the gifts of this space. They use loaded language. That's from the research. That's one of the terms that is used in course of control is loaded language. And it was used in Landmark. They redefine the words. Oh, they take a word that you think has a certain definition, and then they redefine that word as being something else so that they can then use it to manipulate you. In Landmark, the word that we came across probably the most often was breakthrough. And they had a thing that they would say that breakdowns lead to breakthroughs. Well, not always. Like, <laughs> no, sometimes breakdowns just lead to breakdowns because if you are in an abusive relationship and you have a breakdown and you are still in that abusive relationship, the chance that you're going to create a breakthrough out of that breakdown is slim to none. But they use that language to sort of intoxicate you and sort of lull you into submission, like the, you know, the spider in the spider web. And the dangerous part of that um, is that there are a lot of people who are trained in these situations to, to, and they think they know how to work with people who are having problems or issues or blocks or people actually who are in real programs, psychoanalytic programs and other kinds of programs where people are taught to push people to the brink because the more reactivity you get, the more of a response you get, somehow the better it is that you're really helping that person reach some depth of something. But really, you could be pushing them to an unhealthy space or making them fragment. And if you're not equipped to pull them back together, you shouldn't be playing that game. And that's why they have you sign papers before you do the forum. <laughs> you have to sign all sorts of papers saying that you won't sue them because they're well aware of the fact that putting somebody in a room from early in the morning to late at night with hardly any breaks and constant, basically coercive control that people could break. It could create psychotic breaks. It could create trauma. It could reactivate trauma from previous things. And you're right, they're not at all equipped to deal with that. It's very dangerous. I'm curious how it is or what it was for you in Landmark and other relationships, other situations you've been in when you were trying to make a change, when you were needing to say no or maybe, or I got to go. What would happen in those moments to you or to others around you? How are people treated in that moment? What is the coercion basically that's used? And sometimes it's fear-based and sometimes it's you're making the biggest mistake or no one will, you'll never be with anyone again. Or, you know, what are the threats? What happens in those moments? In my most abusive previous relationship, I was not allowed to say no. And when I did, sometimes there would be an immediate response to talk me out of my no, or to tell me why I wasn't allowed to say no, or what was wrong with me. Why would I be saying no to this? Whatever manipulative tactic would be used, or sometimes there wouldn't be any response at all in the moment, but I'd find out next week when I got retaliated against in some other way. And then I found out that, oh, okay, that's, <laughs> this is because of I, because I tried to say no. <laughs> And in that relationship, it escalated to physical violence on a couple of pretty major 
uh, occasions, I've gotten lots of different responses. So anything from purely manipulation, minimizing of my feelings and thoughts, blaming me for the things, all the way up to um, punching me in the face, asphyxiating me. And at one point when I was with my ex, he had not worked. He had not been bringing in an income for several years. Um, I had tried to leave him on numerous occasions prior to this point. But finally, when I discovered that now we were going to lose the house, I said, you get a job or you, you're going to live in the guest house until you get a job. And the next day, Child Protective Services showed up at my house and was threatening to take my kids because there were lies that had been told to CPS. The initial attack, the first violent attack where I was asphyxiated, I called the police. And when the police arrived, he lied to the police and he got me arrested. And he had marks on his chest to show because while he was trying to kill me, I scratched him. And he told the police that I did it. So they arrested me. And so when, so sometimes especially with someone as covert as the person I was with at that time, they will use other people to harm you. They will sabotage your relationships with your family, with your friends. They will tell lies about you behind your back. They call it a smear campaign in the uh, narcissistic abuse world. (laughs) They divide and conquer. And you won't even know what was said about you until you go to them and ask for help when you are so desperate and drowning in quicksand, psychosocial quicksand is what I would call it. When you're so desperate and you are begging for help and you tell this person, that's when you find out that your ex has been lying to them all along about you and that they have sided with him. And so there's lots and lots of ways that coercive controllers will override your no. That is the perfect test is to say no, to say, oh, I'd rather do such and such. You know, like that's your soft version of the, of the "Mm, maybe (laughs) I'd rather do such and such and see what they do. And if they continue to push or they won't accept your no, or they become angry or they manipulate or they, whatever, And that's a real sign that you're not in a safe relationship or a safe environment. I'm so sorry, first of all, that you went through all of that. That is really horrific. It's so debilitating too. When powers that be, police and others, protect the perpetrator and re-victimize the victim. That's one of the reasons I'm very happy that you have your organization because I think so many people who should be in a position to protect are able to be used against the victim. It happens a lot in cases. I was involved in something I've also talked about on the podcast with a family that had a daughter who was 19, although when she got involved, she was under 18, but then she was 19 at the time. They hadn't been able to locate her. She got entangled with a quote unquote psychic who took her over, took over her life and was about to marry her off to their son. And she came from a family of means, I guess, and she wanted to kind of tap into her. And she was considered a missing person at that point. And one of the local malls here suddenly, one of the people working at the mall picked up on that there was something off here, that this girl was being dragged, really like dragged by another woman who said, this is my daughter, but they look nothing alike. She was treating her very harshly. And the daughter had pupils that were dilated in the middle of the day with the light of the mall. She knew something was really wrong. And she luckily called the police. But unfortunately, and I was called too by the family who were alerted and we got there and the police made a barricade, a human barricade, but not to protect the daughter from the psychic. It was to protect her from her family. And I could see this barricade. I'm on one side with the parents who are sobbing, crying, trying to get to their daughter. They use all their savings to try to find her. And the the psychic mom, whatever she, she called herself her gypsy mom is what she called her. That's, I know it's not a PC term, but that's what this woman called herself. She, she just kind of sneered and said, thank you officers and took this girl away into her car. And they didn't see her for years after that. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we just asked this girl if she's over 18. And she said, yes. Yeah. So she has rights. 
I said, did you want to turn around for a second, see how she was being dragged? Did you, for a second, did you want to notice that? But that's what they were trained to do, just to ask if the person's over 18. (laughs) What? So one of the police officers I could tell looked a little like concerned about what he was doing, but another one who was in charge was very sure this is how you handle these situations. There is so much more educating that needs to be done. So tell me about your organization and what it does and what it can do. And it's fantastic. I'm so glad it exists. Tell us a little bit about it and where people can also find it. So ACUSA is an organization that is committed to ending coercive control, which obviously is a big goal. (laughs) And it's uh, in Coercive Control USA, but we really have a commitment to ending coercive control worldwide. I do um, consulting, speaking, training, and expert witness testimony on the topic of coercive control. And the majority of my, I do, uh, I train on my psychosocial quicksand model. So if you have an organization and you would like your team to be trained on coercive control, I come in and I bring my easy to understand visual metaphorical model to train. And I can train therapists, law enforcement, multidisciplinary teams. The majority of my clients right now are survivors who are in family court and they are in the midst of a custody battle with an abuser. And so for those folks, I do um, assessments on their case to assess the level of coercive control that they've been subjected to, to assess the harm done to them and to their children. And then I assess the risk moving forward so that hopefully the fact finders in court will have the proper context to understand the things that are happening. Right. And I mean, I'm so happy and I hope that you that you do training across the United States for police officers. I ended up working with this girl and by the time she got out, she was 22. She escaped and went to a shelter and then walked to some, like had no shoes. They had taken her shoes. The woman had taken her shoes. And she had to walk barefoot and found a place to stay and then found her way back home with nothing. Just like n- lovely people who saw that she was really suffering and needed a bus ticket and other things. She made her way back home, which was amazing, but she was a wreck. But one of the things that was really hard for her, and I guess I really want law enforcement to hear this, is that... Well, she was very confused at the time and she was actually being drugged also, she said, and the psychic people, (laughs) the people who were in control of her had a connection with someone who was a a psychiatrist who gave them drugs. I mean, they were all cahoots with each other. And so that they could keep her more docile, which is a horrible situation. But that when she saw the police, there was a part of her that thought, finally, I'm going to be rescued. And when she just saw their backs and she heard them yelling at her parents to their daughter leave their daughter alone and she's an adult she lost all hope and that's why when she got out she didn't go to the police um she thought they would send her back i mean the police in that moment are not only making a statement to the parents whatever they're making a statement to the victim about how there's no one protecting them so it's really important i think for police to know that and that there's nothing out there There's no system in place to protect a victim. And then they won't go for help after because this is what happened at the beginning. Anyway, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but go ahead. That's why I didn't want to call the police again. Because when I called the police, they arrested me. I mean, that was, I'd, I'd never had so much as a speeding ticket in my life, not a parking ticket in my life, nothing. And to be arrested and kept overnight in a cell, it was humiliating. It was terrifying. And so I didn't want to go to the police again. I didn't trust them. And I don't have a problem with police. (laughs) I have a problem with the way that the system has trained the police to respond in situations that involve coercive control because they don't understand it. They're not seeing it. As I said, because it's invisible, just like quicksand, you can't see it and you have to know what to look for so that you can see where the quicksand is. Where's the edge of this quicksand? Where is the perpetrator and where is the victim survivor? What's happening all over the systems is they're getting these cases backwards, especially in family court. They're getting everything upside down. 
And the main reason for that is that the coercive controller is typically incredibly manipulative, charming sometimes. They will lie and you cannot, they are so good at lying (laughs) that you, you believe them. I believed my ex for years and he was lying to my face. (laughs) And so you've got the coercive controller manipulating and looking calm and assured. And then you've got the survivor on the other side who is terrified that their child is going to have to be in the home with their abuser. And now that they're divorced, they can't protect their kid. At least when they were together, they could protect their child from this person. But now, not only can they not protect them, they don't even know what's happening in the home. And so the victim in a custody case where you've got a coercive controller, the victim is desperate. She's traumatized. Almost always is she, although that's not 100% of the cases. There are male victims, but for the most part, it's female victims and male perpetrators. And the mothers are terrified of losing their kids. There are children being murdered in this country following bad custody decisions where judges who have been given the information and the judge knows that there's domestic violence and they still turn the kids over into unsupervised visitation with that child. It's happening all over the country. And then some of these children are killed by those perpetrators. And it's all on the record that the, that the mothers have explained and begged and pleaded and told them how dangerous this person is. And the court does not believe them. The women are not found credible because they, they're so traumatized. They can't quote unquote, keep their story straight. They're not lying. They're traumatized. And so that's one of the things that I train on is this is what a victim can look like. And this is what a perpetrator can look like so that they don't get it backwards like they did in the Gabby Petito case, for example. The officers got all buddy-buddy with the murderer and Gabby paid the ultimate price because they found her to be the primary aggressor and she was not. So we need the systems trained to understand this and to be able to identify the signs of course of control so that they can make appropriate decisions and protect the person who's actually in danger. There's a concern, of course, that when the police are called, the abuser is going to become more abusive in retaliation or just more clever at hiding it and because they haven't learned the error of their ways. It's not like their conscience kicks in, you know, like, oh, well, wow, I really need to change. No, I need to up my game so that this doesn't happen again, or I need to find a way so that the police really can't detect anything. There was a situation I came across with a couple of different families, and I realized it was a trend at the time. I don't know if it still is, but there were a number of families where one of the parents was a Jehovah's Witness. And I'm not saying this is a worldwide Jehovah's Witness tact, but this was happening here in LA and maybe in other places where if there was a divorce, the parent who was the Jehovah's Witness who had any standing in the church was encouraged, and it could have just been by one of the pastors there, to accuse the other parent of abuse so that they could get full custody and raise their child up right. And suddenly police were coming in with a particular family. They had like a two-year-old. Uh, suddenly DCS is coming in and interviewing the parents. They have no idea what's going on. And this child is two-year-old is taken out of the home, put in a foster or something, just a place for overnight while this all gets figured out. Everyone's traumatized. And it was just that this was sort of to help people lead their life in the right way, you know, according to how God wanted it. I thought, well, I don't know if that's really the right way to traumatize a whole other bunch of people and a child. Um, But they didn't ask, like, 
where's this idea coming from that now you think this person who has no record and is perfectly upstanding citizen and member of the community and member of the PTA is suddenly abusing her children. Mm, There've been no signs of it. The kids seem healthy, but still we're going to swoop in. I, the police and, and, and law enforcement, I think in general, need to know what questions to ask, what to find out before they go ahead and affect everyone's life in this way. I'm wondering just for people moving forward, I know that you've given some really great signs about what to look out for. Are you noticing that this kind of coercive control happens in more sort of in certain environments to a greater degree than in other environments? Is it with people who have a certain personality disorder that repeats itself? Is it with these kind of large group awareness trainings or, I mean, I've even seen it in 12 step for some people. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that question before. I'll have to think about your last one about the 12 steps. I have certainly seen it in the areas where it occurs most often, which is going to be in high control groups, also known as cults, in human trafficking, domestic abuse, often in gangs where they can be, you know, they, in the Nexium cult, the women were branded, right? Well, in some gangs, you're branded. So those are the typical places that you find the most, I would say, the the sort of pervasive pattern of course of control. But there's course of control in everywhere <laughs> because anywhere that there are people, you're going to have a certain percentage that have personality disorders. And so you're going to find the narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial, um, or the, you know, the psychopath or sociopath person, they could be anywhere. They can be in any environment. And so I believe that understanding the pattern of course of control is important for everybody so that everyone can protect themselves and their loved ones and their friends because there's coercion built or baked into our systems. The way that police question suspects is coercive. You know, they use coercive tactics. They use manipulation. They use deceit. They use course of control in their job. Attorneys, the way that they question people on the stand is a very coercive and controlling pattern of questioning. That's why when you get on the stand, at least when I get on the stand to testify, it makes me nervous because I know that there's going to be a person who's going to be asking me questions in a way that inherently is a trap. If you're doing something in a way that traps someone, then that's coercive control. You may not be a coercive controller. And all of us, every once in a while, will have one of these things that we might do, especially if we're incredibly stressed. (laughs) Um, We may do something that's coercive or controlling. We may do something that that isolated incident might have been abusive. But with coercive control, we're talking about an ongoing pattern of behavior, a drip, drip, drip like water torture of small and then every once in a while, a big drop of different types of abuse, emotional, psychological, financial, litigious, using your children as weapons, all of those things. When you start to see more than one of those types and they're blending together into a pattern, that's coercive control. And that's something you want to be very careful to avoid. And if you notice it, you know, a lot of people will go to the perpetrator when they're getting the nerve to say something. So what do you suggest from what you've seen is a good plan of action or plans of action? What are some good ones that keep you safe along the way when you're starting to notice something? Who do you reach out to? Who do you not? You know, what do you do with this sort of mounting evidence? And it could even be physiological evidence that you're getting headaches, that that you're feeling it in your body, that something's wrong. What do you do with it? That's the safest route. Well, I would say the first thing you probably want to do is talk to a close friend or family member just to sort of bounce off of them, unless you're concerned that they may have already been gotten to by the perpetrator. So if you're in a new relationship and you have friends that you've had for 20 years, those are the people to go to and say, this is happening. I don't know if I'm reading this wrong. Can you help me think this through, talk this through with someone that you know is safe 
that you have a long-term trusting, healthy relationship with. And then there are places that you can reach out to, like the domestic violence hotline. There's a human trafficking hotline. If you're in, in human trafficking, you could go to ICSA, International Cultic Studies Association. There are podcasts like yours that are fabulous to listen to. That's a great place to go and get educated and to sort of listen for potential signs so that you can get a feel for what's really going on. But don't do what I did, which was to stand up to him and say, you are being abusive. Because if you already know that they're abusive and you'd say to them, it's only going to escalate them. So you need to be very careful with what you say to the person that is demonstrating these behaviors. Great advice. And yes, there had been the Cult Awareness Network, which is now run by Scientology. Oh, no. So don't call the Cult Awareness Network. I didn't know that. (laughs) There was an organization that's like a mom and pop organization that started years ago called the Cult Awareness Network. And I was involved with it and on the board of it. And then someone pretending to be a caring person who got on their staff was a Scientologist who in the middle of the night would be copying papers and, you know, get, just was infiltrating. And then they sued the Cult Awareness Network. I think it was like 40 times over a five-year period, something crazy where they just didn't have the funding because they're like, you know, it was all volunteer led basically. So when it had to shut down, the name itself then was able to be taken over or purchased. And it is by by Scientology. So if you call the Cult Awareness Network... You'll be speaking to a Scientologist, just FYI. But yes, there do need to be other organizations, right? So that's back to kind of do your research, right? Like, hmm, let's find out. Although who would have who would have thought that? Who would think that? It's all very kind of crazy. Well, yeah, it's not uncommon for organizations that purport to be doing work to end something like human trafficking or cults or domestic violence, it's not uncommon for them to be actually doing the opposite. Like there was a human trafficking organization that I was told, I found out while I was doing my research and doing my interviews, that there was an organization that was supposedly fighting human trafficking that turned out to be human trafficking. (gasps) Oh no. Oh, that's horrible. It is. And just, but so is the cult awareness network being taken over by Scientology. I mean, you cannot take anything at face value because predators will go into these types of places and try to get into safe spaces for survivors because it's like a feeding ground. You have to be very careful and take your time getting to know people. And quite honestly, it's really a good idea to not share a ton up front so that they don't have something they can use to exploit you. That's true. That's really good advice. And if anyone has been dealing with trafficking, the Avery Center, it's a very legit, wonderful organization. Some of the people have been on here and they just do really, really good work. And so I don't want you to feel dismayed that you're going to be, you know, kind of there's going to be subterfuge wherever you go. But yes, it is really good to to find out the names of organizations where it's been tried and true, where they've been checked out. So if people are dealing with that in particular, contact the Avery Center. And where can people find your organization? The website endcoercivecontrolusa.com. And you can find my social media there as well. I have a resource page that has lots of information for both survivors and for professionals who are working to end course of control, as well as my blog. And if you're in a case that involves course of control, whether that be with a high control group or with intimate partner violence, I have a spot on the website where you can click and get a free consultation with me to find out if I would be of any use as an expert witness or to do an assessment or report on your case. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. It was so good to talk to you. I'm glad your organization exists. I'm glad you exist, especially after what you've been through. I'm really glad you exist. (laughs) Thank you. Um, (laughs) um, And 
that you're using your healing and your strength to really help others and to make a difference and to help to have this lovely kind of, I see it as sort of like a security blanket you want to put over people to help them feel safe and know they have resources, which is wonderful. I wish you well and a pleasure to talk to you. One more thing before you go. Thank you to Kate for all that she is doing. And I'm so pleased that she's come through some pretty harrowing situations to get to this place where she is able to be free and be strong and speak her mind and help others. It is so important to go back to, well, a whole number of things that she talked about. But one of the things that I want to make sure to talk about is that she used the word exploit. When she talked about having been in one abusive relationship or group after another, after another, and I was relaying the fact that I hear about that a lot, and it happens a lot where there is this repetition of finding yourself in yet another situation that's not healthy for you, where you kind of lose yourself in it and lose your ability to have agency to protect yourself. And really, at the end of the day, it's because you don't matter in that organization or in that relationship. She was saying that as she got farther and farther along in her last abusive relationship, that this is a person who then could exploit the traumas that she had had, the abuse that she had endured in previous relationships. That word exploit needs to be highlighted. When we talk about anyone who can do really serious damage to other people, It is often because their intention is to kind of mine the jewels in you, to just use you up until there's nothing left, till there's just a big hole in the ground, like an abandoned mine. And what people can exploit are the things that have left you feeling damaged, not feeling deserving of something better, a better life, a happier life not feeling deserving of being treated nicely because you've come to believe that somehow you deserve to be treated poorly because you had enough conditioning in previous relationships or groups to teach you that lesson. But what's also true is that your best qualities can be exploited as well. And the wonderfully naive parts of you that I wish people could hold on to for longer, that wonderful bubble that people get to live in until they have that first experience of their mother or father being wrong about something and noticing it, that they're not perfect, or the first time that they are undermined or betrayed by a friend or hurt by someone. It's like the whole world shifts on its axis and everything changes in that moment. And I wish that moment could last for a long time for people, but it gets pierced at a young age and sometimes repeatedly within abusive households, within cultic groups. And those are a lot of the times when people say, I don't feel like I had a childhood. Part of what they're mentioning is that, that they didn't have a chance to just feel like they were in this little protective bubble. And so... When people are trusting because they have no reason not to be, that can be exploited. When people will do for others, even if no one does for them, that can be definitely exploited. And when someone is open-minded, when someone is willing to look at themselves and they get connected with someone who, again, as I've talked about in the past, is more than happy to have you accept all the blame for everything. And if they can kind of be a wordsmith and also turn things around on you, you will feel like, oh, it must have been my fault that they were mean to me or they were abusive to me. I must have triggered them in some way. 
People can also be exploited, though, when they're damaged and hurt and hurting. And when they're also feeling alone, when they're feeling like their life has been so different that no one can relate to them or no one would want them anymore because they feel damaged. When you feel like the best parts of you or the most hurt parts of you are being used as a means of controlling you, that is certainly time to leave. But sometimes you don't notice it until something else happens that Kate talked about, which is that sometimes you need an opportunity, whether it's something you craft or something that's imposed on you, like when COVID came through and a lot of people had a chance to be separate and not in person with others, and then they could spend some time away from their controllers. Those are the moments when sometimes you realize a lot about something, when you've been able to take a step away, when you then can be with people who do actually care about you and want to take care of you and ask you back, and how are you? Someone controlling you is only going to ask you how you are so they can use whatever information you give them in your response against you. They don't really care. It's only if it's advantageous to them to know that information. And so you might not notice that when you're in it. You might be so in need of that affection and attention. You might be so in need of being mistreated because you feel that that's the way to pay penance for something wrong that you've done before or in a past life or whatever they've convinced you of. But I encourage you to take time away, whether you just have to find an excuse or it's somehow imposed on you because you have to go to something or you're just not feeling well and you just have to stay home or you have to stay in bed. Take that time to think. Take that time away where you're not just thinking, what do I have to do next to please this person? And how do I have to make sure that they're still going to be happy with me, even if I'm not showing up to make them dinner or if I'm not showing up to set up the chairs for the meeting? Instead, think, am I happy? Are other people having the life that I at times really wish I had that seems to just always be eluding me? Like maybe happiness isn't in my future is what a lot of people have said to me went through their minds when they were involved in cults or in abusive relationships. Like I guess happiness is just for others. Think about those statements. Take some quiet time. Take some time away if you can. Even if it means coming up with an excuse that you have to go do an errand or just you have to sit in your car or on a bus, take time away, but really take time away emotionally and think, is this the life that I want to be living? And what part of the day, what percentage of the day am I taken care of while I'm busy running around taking care of everyone else or advancing the goals of the group or mm, completing or getting closer to completing the mission? or pleasing the person with me who seems so hard to please. When is the last time I could think about what I wanted and someone else cared about what I wanted and someone else was willing to do something for me? And if it's been a day or two, okay. But if it's been a year or two, that's time to go. I wish you well, and I thank you, Kate, for all the work that you're doing. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.